okay so in the last class we were discussing about uh, you know eicosanoids the like we began the topic on lipids act acting as uh, signaling molecules and uh, cofactor pigments etc so that is the topic we started and in that first we uh, looked at uh, how the membrane phospholipid that is phosphatidic uh, acid with an inositol where that inositol in the form of uh, trisphosphate ip3 acting as an intracellular signal like second messenger so we saw that then we discussed the eicosanoids like the three signaling molecules produced from the 20 carbon uh, fatty acid arachidonic acid like we saw the prostaglandins then thromboxanes and leukotrienes and uh, how they function uh, as signaling molecules so we continue that theme uh, today so we today we are going to look at the another set of uh, signaling molecules that are lipids the here the class of lipid is the sterols so these are cholesterol derivative so that's why here on the left i have shown you the cholesterol structure so remember the basic structure of a sterol this cyclopentenophenanthrene ring so this is the basic uh, nucleus of sterols and the side uh, the derivations like this hydroxyl group methyl group here methyl group here and this long aliphatic chain and this is where the individual molecules change and the position of double bonds so on the right you have the structures of four hormones so the first one is testosterone this is the male reproductive hormone this is produced by the testis and the rest of the uh, male physiology anatomy everything comes from the actions of this hormone testosterone so genetically on the chromosome there is only one gene that determines whether you are going to be a male or not not the entire y chromosome and that gene codes for the development of testis that's the only thing then the rest are all the hormonal product of testis which is the testosterone um, so without that uh, TDF or testis determining factor located on Y chromosome, uh, deleting that but having an entire Y chromosome, the default anatomy and physiology, everything is actually female. So becoming a female is the default route in development. Uh, so the female secondary uh, sexual characteristics as well as the oocyte maturation production, everything is regulated by estradiol okay so so there is only a subtle difference if you look at this uh you know this keto enol difference and then this methyl group so this double bond position is essentially due to this difference you know this um dub, uh, double bond o2 hydroxyl group and that's why this double bond now becomes between this carbon and this switches to here and then you have one more here because you don't have the methyl group. So th there is very subtle difference. So, but it makes profound uh, difference in terms of the signaling. So these are produced by the gonads. This is produced by the testis. This is probably produced by the ovary. So there are uh, other sterile hormones. Uh, these are produced by adrenal gland. So the adrenal gland is something that sits on top of the kidneys. And these glands have an outer portion called the cortex and then the middle portion called the medulla, okay? So the cortex produces the sterol hormones, uh, two major kinds called glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. Here we have one example each. So cortisol is a glucocorticoid family sterol. So, so the name itself tells you gluco corticoid so the oid is steroid cortic is the cortex of adrenal gland gluco meaning to do with glucose regulation okay so cortisol is important to regulate glucose level it, pr it promotes uh, glucose formation from non carbohydrate molecules a process called gluconeogenesis we will learn later 
and um, so this is important for maintaining um, uh, glucose uh, level and it is also required for uh, you know many other uh, metabolic regulations as well as for example regulating uh, immune response um, so this acts as an anti inflammation so basically it suppresses immune response so you would wonder why one should suppress immune response immune response is required to fight disease but you need immune response only when um there is a pathogen okay so you don't want a dog that barks all the time it should bark only when there is a thief around so when it does that when immune system does that when it barks all the time that is what is allergic reaction is okay so a pollen grain that is floating in the air is not going to kill you but if the immune system thinks that is a foreign body and over reacts and you get asthma and the doctor earlier like uh, 20 30 years ago used to right away give you a steroid prescription and they act as competitive inhibitors of cortisol and they suppress immune response but they have side effects therefore nowadays they don't use it unless otherwise it's absolutely essential and the next one is the aldosterone so these are called mineralocorticoids corticoids meaning they are involved in mineral metabolism like for example when the components in the blood are filtered through by our nephrons in the kidney you don't want to lose everything so there is a reabsorption like for example water gets reabsorbed uh, sodium potassium um their level in the blood stream is regulated by reabsorption or excretion and those mineral levels are regulated by aldosterone and as a result it is very very critical for maintaining blood pressure okay so sodium potassium levels if they vary uh, beyond the normal range then you have serious problem with blood pressure and uh, you know uh, heart malfunction so for that aldosterone is the main regulator okay so these are the four major steroid hormones that we need to know so the sex hormones that is testosterone and estradiol and then the adrenal hormones cortisol involved in glucose metabolism and immune response and uh, it's it, in immune response it is actually anti inflammatory and the aldosterone in maintaining the uh, you know ionic balance like mineral balance sodium potassium level maintenance in the blood so another important point about these hormones uh, when contrasted with the ones that we recently learned we, we didn't learn about all hormones we learned about uh, only the eicosanoids and I, at that time i told you they function in the vicinity of the cell that produces them and therefore they are called paracrine hormones uh by contrast these four are uh, endocrine so these are ductless glands and therefore they are called endocrine and but the main point is they act on distant organs by traveling via blood stream okay so they travel in blood stream to different tissues they don't work uh, just in the nearby cells um and they do not have this long alkyl chain and then since there are these are hydrophobic they can directly pass through diffuse through the cell membrane and nuclear membranes and bind to transcription factors like proteins in the nucleus and alter gene expression and as a result uh, finally have an effect on the metabolism so so this is what i just finished uh, telling you without coming to this slide um okay the next group we are going to go to the cofactors so we saw the signaling molecules both the paracrine and endocrine, uh, endocrine signals so now we are going to look at the cofactors so these cofactors are uh you know important uh, for enzymatic catalysis okay so they they aid or uh, enzymes ability to catalyze a reaction by temporarily accepting a group or donating a group 
um, in that manner, these cofactors participate and help. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, so they are the vitamins. And within vitamins, you have uh, B complex vitamins that do that job primarily. By contrast, the fat soluble vitamins, the listed here, A, D, E, K. So these are not uh, primarily uh, cofactors in enzymatic catalysis. So they do function along with proteins, but not as cofactors. Okay. So they help in a variety of cellular processes. And we we'll look at them uh, one at a time and now. So all four of them are having this group uh, shown here, isoprene. This is 2-methylbutadiene. So this is butane if it is fully saturated. And you have two double bonds, therefore it is butadiene. And you have a methyl group uh, at the carbon number two. So therefore it is called a 2-methyl uh, you know, uh, butadiene. Okay, and that structure repeats in many molecules, and that basic repeat is called isoprene. So, isoprene is methyl butadiene. So, this isoprene repeats multiple times in multiple manners. In, it's not that always they have the double bond, sometimes these are saturated, as you will see when we look at these four structures. And then they have other aromatic rings attached to these repeat units. Um, and we'll see each one of them as we go. So the first one uh, we are having is D. Okay. So D vitamin in its active form is shown here on the right. 125, one carbon, one here, 25 carbon here, 25th carbon. They have hydroxyl groups, so 125 dihydroxy. The basic structure is the cholecalciferol. Okay, 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. This is what is the active form of vitamin D, also known as vitamin D3. Uh, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3. So, this molecule, active molecule, is produced from this basic uh, structure called. 7 dehydrocholesterol. So, this, uh, this position uh, is the one where the ring opens, and that is why it is shaded here to create this intermediate. Then the hydroxylation leads to the active molecule. Okay. So, so this structure upon UV, so this is the reason the doctor tells you to walk in the sunlight at least for half an hour a day. You know, we do not normally do it in the modern times in India. So nearly 95% of the Indian population as a result, okay, mark my words, 95% of the Indian population is deficient in vitamin D. Okay. So now it actually has given rise to a debate. If 95% are deficient in something, do we even need to revisit and understand what is the normal requirement and what is the normal range? Okay, so that sort of a debate uh, goes on about the vitamin D. But the main point uh, to remember is um, the UV wavelengths in the sunlight um, acting on our skin converts on in our skin. You generate this intermediate, which then through a couple of steps, one in liver and one in kidney, become the active vitamin D. And this vitamin, by the very name vitamin, indicates it's uh, required in the food. Anytime you say vital, essential, what it means is those molecules cannot be made by our cells. They, they are required for us, but they cannot be made and therefore they have to come through the food. So anything that is essential but need to be obtained only through food, they are usually called vital or essential. So essential amino acids, essential fatty acids. What those two terms mean is those amino acids and fatty acids, our cells do not make them. So they have to be obtained through the food. 
simply because our cells do not make doesn't mean we don't need them they are required and that is why they are essential so here the upper figure is self explanatory you know this particular child uh, having vitamin d deficiency they, um, i presume these pictures are from scandinavian countries because there the sunlight is low and therefore before the discovery of vitamin d's role <clears throat> the children did suffer um, vitamin d deficiency and they have you know rickety bones and that's why it's called rickets the disease and 14 months later of providing vitamin d you look at how the child is okay this is why people say knowledge is power so inquiring and investigating nature and understanding the molecular basis of it help us solve this problem okay so it's it's very dramatic you can see the difference between these two pictures and this is what vitamin d does vitamin d is essential for calcium uptake calcium homeostasis okay and calcium is an important component of the bone so uptake of calcium in the intestine and uh, maintaining calcium levels uh, for that vitamin d is essential okay <clears throat> and uh, this is the isoprene thing you may think where is the isoprene in the previous slide you said these are all isoprene derivatives where is the isoprene so this read this is what is isoprene derivative here we have a bulky steroid um, you know the nucleus attached to it and therefore you don't see the structure as a big thing so this is vitamin d and next is vitamin a so vitamin a does couple of things one it actually functions in acid form retinoic acid as a uh, regulator of gene expression it is a hormone okay so as a hormone it signals cells um, by controlling gene expression okay it binds to a transcription factor and those transcription factors bind to specific dna sequences called retinoic acid response elements uh, and activate a uh, gene expression and the other major function it does is uh remember our uh, stereochemistry we learned about geometric isomerism where when you have uh, a carbon carbon double bond uh, the groups attached to the two carbons can either have cis orientation or trans orientation so that is also called cis trans isomerism and uh, cis trans isomerism in this vitamin a in the aldehyde version okay so here this is the aldehyde functional group and this in this here you have a double bond shaded in blue so here you have this group on this side of the carbon and this group on this side of the carbon both are on the same side so this is 11th carbon therefore it is 11 cis retinal so this one under the influence of visible light it switch flips into the trans retinal conformation and this cis retinal to trans retinal conversion uh, upon shining light uh, is how our eye senses light okay this generates a signal and that through the optic uh, you know a uh, nerve goes to the brain uh, to the visual center and the brain you know constructs the image so the light is sensed by our eye you know when the lens focuses eye on the um you know the uh so i'm just uh, momentarily forgetting the name it um you know converts this retinal cis to trans so that is how the rods and cones in our eyes the two cells that are involved in sensing light this is the way they sense the light this conversion from one iso 
mer to another iso mer okay the word i forgot is retina okay when the lens focuses the light at the back of the eye you know like i don't know how much you guys have paid attention in your earlier um, school or college class like for example i'm going to draw here i'll draw by selecting black color so let's say if this is your eyeball so this is as if uh so you're looking this way okay this is the way you are looking so this is side way at your eye and if this is where your lens and the light falls here so at the back of the eye this is what is retina and this is where the light falls and activates and this is where uh you know this transformation is happening and that through the optic nerve uh, it goes to the brain to visual center and there this change, this basically generates a, a signal which is electric signal in the optic nerve so so now you understand the importance of um, uh lipids in our uh, life okay so you will be blind without um, vitamin a and uh, this is trans isomerism the interconversion between the two so later once the signaling is over it reverts back to this so every time uh, this flip flop keeps happening so in india about 55 million children become blind every year due to lack of adequate vitamin a in our food and the absence of retinoic acid also leads to growth retardation so decades ago a scientist um, at johns hopkins school of public health uh, by observing children in um, the current chatisgarh and jharkhand area found that lot of growth defects that these children suffer can actually be reversed inexpensively by administering few drops of vitamin a every day for a few weeks and uh, the whole retardation etc all are restored you really do not need to do serious uh, food supplements uh, to make those children to come to normal so this is the profound effect of vitamin a so how is, where do we get vitamin a usually from uh, two major sources one milk uh, milk directly contains this retinol the alcohol form and then uh, oxidation gives you the aldehyde and then further oxidation of this aldehyde gives you the retinoic acid uh, the other really abundant source is uh, carrot uh carrot color is due to the presence of this beta carotene it's basically two molecules of vitamin a so this double bond needs to be cleaved to make the retinol so this beta carotene it's it's basically a quarter of carrot per day is yen of that those children will not suffer but unfortunately you know we have very different priorities and these are not important those children having normal development and not suffering um i say it is not our high priority and therefore we don't care to give them this quarter of a carrot per child so that is philosophical aspect of biochemistry uh, let's get back to biochemistry itself uh, move on from a to now e so e is uh, remember we were talking about uh, rancidity uh, lipid peroxidation the when you have double bond in the aliphatic chain you can have oxygen added to added between those two carbons and that is a peroxide all that i was talking about and how that causes rancidity and membrane damage all that so for that the free radicals that are produced need to be scavenged and they are done by molecules that can readily take up um, electrons and scavenge electrons and they are called antioxidants so we have two kinds of antioxidants one that needs to pump uh, function in the membrane phase 
and another one in the aqueous phase. In aqueous phase, primarily done by a vitamin called vitamin C, which is a water soluble vitamin. So we will see vitamin C somewhere else um, later when we learn metabolism. For now, we focus on the lipid phase. In the lipid phase, that antioxidant job is done by this tocopherols, commonly known as vitamin E. And this is the vitamin E structure. So you have a long isoprenoid unit. So this is uh, indicated by these pink lines. And you have this uh, aromatic ring attached to this. So these uh, tocopherols in the ring structure can easily take up electrons and uh, therefore prevent oxidation of membrane lipids. So they, they are hydrophobic, they are in cell membranes and lipid deposits and lipoproteins. So these carry, these are proteins that carry lipids in the bloodstream. We will learn about it when we go to lipid metabolism. So they, by these tocopherols function primarily as antioxidants, okay. And the last one in this group is vitamin K, also called dolichols. Um, so we will see dolichols as a separate group in the next slide. So these vitamin, vitamin K are um, usually found in plant leaves as well as our intestinal microflora, intestinal bacteria produce them. So, so if you take a lot of antibiotics, uh, usually you have to take some vitamin supplements along with them uh, because the antibiotics that you take to get rid of an infection will kill the intestinal microflora as well. So therefore you may suffer some of the vitamin deficiencies including K. And K is readily available in uh, green leaves. So eating green leaves is really important. So essentially eating a lot of vegetables is very important and less of everything else. Um, and its deficiency can have internal blood hemorrhage, okay, so blood bleed, bleeding internally. So for clot formation, you need vitamin K. And here again, you have the isoprenoid structure you see and with an aromatic um, ring attached. So then remember our title said the pigments um, uh, that are important. And here we see uh, pigments. These function as cofactors. Uh, these are actually important in the electron transport chain in the chloroplast uh, if it is the photosynthesis or if it is the regular respiration in the mitochondria. So these, uh, what these molecules do, these, the, these quinones, because they have the basic quinone structure. So ubiquinone, also known as coenzyme Q, uh, is on the membrane. So this is in the inner membrane of mitochondria. We will learn this in detail when we go to electron transport chain. Um, so in so essentially uh, in this inner membrane, you have protein complexes that are embedded on the membrane. And these protein complexes transfer electrons from the food that, uh, that is being oxidized in an incremental steps, okay, this is like instead of rolling down a slope, you are walking down one step at a time, okay, to final ultimate acceptor, which is oxygen. And in the process, oxygen gets, ox uh, you know, reduced to carbon dioxide. So when these protein complexes embedded on the membrane, transfer electrons in this manner between the two different uh, such complexes on the membrane in the lipid phase this ubiquinones help in transferring the electrons so that is what the ubiquinones do this is in the respiration and similarly plastoquinones do the same job in the photosynthesis where electron is obtained by splitting water and that is being uh, transferred and finally to make uh, a, you know, 
uh, a reduced uh, form of another cofactor called NADPH. And uh, so in that process again, there are complexes on the membrane in the chloroplast and they are the ones that transfer the electrons and between the complexes on the membrane in the lipid phase, these plastoglinons help in transferring the electrons. And these are the uh, structures. So these are the lipid quinones. These are important for the oxidation reduction reactions. So since they help in transfer, we call them as cofactors. So this is a dolly call, you know, uh, uh, the vitamin K is a version of dolly call, the, just that the dolly calls don't have that aromatic group. So these dolly calls are important for activating uh, sugar molecules. So, uh, for example, the enzymes that are going to add sugars to lipids to make uh, lipopolysaccharides. Remember, we have already seen them. Our blood group is um, glycosylated, um, you know, mem membrane lipid, like we saw the sphingolipids. So there we saw the carbohydrates attached. And to add sugars like that to the membrane lipids, these dolly calls help. So they accept, uh, they, you know, uh, the sugars. And then since these are hydrophobic and anchored on the membrane, so they essentially anchor sugars to the, bring the sugars to the membrane and help in transferring to the membrane attached uh, lipids. And through that process, they help the assembly of bacterial cell walls. And then uh, they help in adding polysaccharide units to certain proteins as well on the membrane. So, so this is essentially activating sugar precursors for biosynthesis of membrane-bound glycolipids and glycoproteins. So that's what the dolly calls do. All right, with this, we finish the second part of our lipids discussion. So the second part primarily focused on signaling kind of lipid molecules. So we saw the eicosanoids, then we saw the sterol hormones, steroid hormones, then we saw these uh, vitamins D, E, K, okay, and then the quinones. So the first part focused on the main group of lipids like the st storage lipids like triacylglycerols or membrane lipids like glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids. Uh, then of course, uh, steroid cholesterol. So this, this is what encompasses the, uh, mm, the uh, structures and functions of various uh, lipid molecules. So we, we have covered at some depth the structure of carbohydrates and then we saw amino acids and therefore proteins. Then we have seen lipids. So the one group that we are ignoring here are the nucleotides. It's primarily because um, I'm assuming this is being covered in molecular biology, therefore I don't want to duplicate it here. So that is why we are not learning the nucleotides. So we omitting it in this course doesn't mean those molecules do not belong in biochemistry are not important for a biochemistry to learn. It's um, to the contrary, they are very much center of the, um, you know, biomolecules. It is just that in our curriculum, uh, it is going to be elaborately covered in molecular biology and therefore I'm not uh, duplicating it here. So instead we will go to uh, what actually all these molecules do, you know, uh, we have multiple times learned that there are biosynthetic steps, uh, breakdown and build up and uh, enzymes catalyze those reactions, etc. So now we will really get into those reactions. What are those reactions and what's the logic behind those reactions and how they are important for the uh, life of an organism. And that whole process is what is metabolism. Okay, some total of all interconversions of molecules that happen in our uh, cell. 
so so we we'll go step by step it is uh, some students think it is very daunting and very difficult and intimidating all that but i am hoping that the way we are going to look at metabolism uh, you will end up fascinated and excited about metabolism so that's what i'm hoping so let's go step by step to get to that end goal so uh, once again to recapitulate the definition metabolism is a highly coordinated activity of large number of uh, enzymes okay so because you have large number of steps and they don't act independent of each other they are all coordinated you will readily see in um, you know few slides as well as in the rest of the course and in the rest of learning biology in other courses you will realize that the all the enzyme catalyzed reactions um all are highly interconnected and coordinated and um metabolism actually exists in terms of pathways they each biochemical reaction does not happen in isolation they are part of a series of individual reactions okay and that series is what you call as pathway for example glucose doesn't become glucose 6 phosphate meaninglessly with glucose 6 phosphate only as the end product so that one biochemical reaction of glucose getting phosphorylated is part of a pathway that finally produces a uh, energy out of glucose okay by breaking down the 6 carbon hexose into 3 carbon pyruvate and in the process partially oxidizing it you get some energy and then that pyruvate uh, gets further oxidized ultimately to the most oxidized form of carbon that is carbon dioxide uh, in mitochondria getting some more energy so therefore there is an end goal and to get the end goal there are multiple interconnected individual biochemical reactions and those interconnected series of reactions is what is the metabolic pathway and uh, since they have multiple individual steps therefore you have multiple specific enzymes so what does metabolism achieve um they are listed here one is uh, energy okay so either by taking up an energy rich uh, molecule meaning a molecule which has potential for losing electrons and while losing electrons to a molecule that more readily can accept so therefore it is uh, delta g being uh, negative and therefore there is free energy release meaning the ground state of the product its energy content is lower than the energy content of the substrate so through that process you get chemical energy so this is from the nutrients that is what we do okay whatever food we eat the mitochondria through uh, respiration a process called oxidative phosphorylation and ends up generating energy another one what the uh, other organisms you know a good example will be the plants what they do is they use the solar energy to make um in a nutrient rich uh, molecules so there again they get chemical energy okay the solar energy becomes chemical energy so these two modes of obtaining energy is one of the goals accomplished by the metabolism another one fine i get some nutrients and from that do i get only the nutrient energy and nothing else no you do make molecules that are unique to your own cells okay like for example only adrenal cortex is going to make cortisol and aldosterone okay so only the rods and cones in our retina are required uh, require um, you know uh, vitamin a so therefore there are cell specific molecules required the building blocks of the individual cells themselves so they are also made by rearranging the atoms of the nutrient molecules so that is another goal of metabolism 
the third is building bigger structures okay like you provide glucose then i make lot of glycogen and store in the liver or i convert even further into fatty acids and convert into triacylglycerol and store in my um adipocytes or i make phospholipids and make new membranes and uh, you know cells can divide and grow so and then every time a cell is going to divide you have to copy the dna so you are making nucleotides to fuse and make uh, long chain nucleotides so nucleic acids and you make new proteins and all of these macromolecule synthesis from the monomers is another goal of metabolism and the fourth is to make uh, biomolecules with specialized uh, cell function such as the ones listed here lipids intracellular messengers and pigments and so on so these are the four main uh, purposes of metabolism okay getting energy cell specific molecule production then making macromolecules and then producing specialized molecules like the signaling molecules membrane lipids and so on so before we go into those individual reactions we had to take a bird say view of metabolism that is what is going to make us excited about metabolism we should always have a, uh, the big picture and big picture is highly philosophical you you will see that it simply uh, you know cycling of matter that is all you achieve regardless of what walks of life you are going you are at or what career goals you pursue at the end all organisms existing the only thing they do is endlessly cycle matter in the way diagrammed here and that is unstoppable as long as sun's energy is falling on earth so you have these uh, you know organisms called autotrophs so autotrophs can make uh, the basic molecules themselves they do not need energy from the nutrients produced by other organisms they can use sun's energy and to uh, and then make energy rich chemicals by themselves and they are called autotrophs okay they are not dependent on other organisms for um, organic macromolecules they can make from the elements themselves and they are the autotrophs and the autotrophs that use sun's energy are the photosynthetic like plants Uh, cyanobacteria and so on and these are going to uh, under the influence of sun's energy convert carbon dioxide and water into major organic molecules that we have seen uh, we have learned in the last uh, 13 classes and why do they make them what happens to the molecules that they make well they are eaten by heterotrophs as well as these through their respiration convert them back to carbon dioxide and water so essentially in the living uh, system like in the biosphere carbon oxygen and water are massively cycled all the time why there is no answer to that question it, 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 this is what happens because sun's light falls and these chemical reactions happen so there is nothing more to derive from um life than this it is simply cycling of matter so next a little bit detail on the same thing uh, so in the previous one we saw only carbon dioxide and the water um and oxygen so in the process of uh, respiration where you break down macromolecules like glucose into carbon dioxide the process consumes oxygen okay so that is where oxygen comes into picture and the photosynthesis itself takes up water uh, and in from water is where you get the hydrogen to make this uh, organic products for example you take carbohydrate you understand 
carbon comes from carbon dioxide energy comes from sun where does hydrogen come from that comes from water so water carbon dioxide enter into this then you get organic molecules and then oxygen out of it and these heterotrophs when they break down organic products like glucose back into i'm just using glucose as a convenient example here you know instead of simply saying organic product if you can picture glucose then you will realize glucose is not like fully oxidized carbon so so in the process of breaking down they consume oxygen to produce carbon dioxide out of that so as a result these molecules like these elements like oxygen carbon and hydrogen get cycled in the biosphere so similar thing happens with the nitrogen as well and that is what is shown in this so our cells can't readily use nitrogen from the atmosphere although nitrogen is very abundant in the atmosphere that is simply because nitrogen is triple covalent bonded very very stable structure so you need specialized enzymatic system to reduce the um, you know molecular nitrogen into ammonia and that is done by uh, an enzyme complex present in a um, special type of bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria so these usually are in the soil usually associated with some plant roots um, where they are in symbiotic relationship with the plants so they reduce the atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia and this ammonia can be used by plants by incorporating into amino acids so that is how nitrogen enters into the living system and from plants in the form of amino acids and uh, nucleotides animals get them and animals produce ammonia again you know like this is what is excreted uh, through urine either in the form of urea or uric acid depending on which group of animal you are and this ammonia again can go into plants again it's a cycling or some of the ammonia in the soil are converted by this nitrifying bacteria into nitrates and nitrites and these are again used by plants the way they can use ammonia and it doesn't end there some of the denitrifying bacteria convert these nitrates and nitrites into atmospheric nitrogen okay so nitrifying means getting nitrogen into the bio system and denitrifying means returning it back to atmosphere so that is how you can remember these two so otherwise the main thing you need to remember is atmospheric nitrogen becomes ammonia by the bacteria on the root nodules of plants and that is how it enters into the bio system so here again you have a massive cycling of nitrogen so we saw the cycling of carbon hydrogen oxygen and now nitrogen the four main elements so believe it or not much of the diversity that exists in life requires only a handful of elements from the periodic table so the next point we are going to consider before we break today is the energy relationship okay it looks complex but it's not that uh, difficult so here we are going to look at two important terms one is called anabolism another one is called catabolism so these are the two different branches of metabolism so the synthetic reactions of the metabol metabolism are called the anabolism and the breakdown steps are uh, reactions are the catabolism like for example breaking down glucose to carbon dioxide and in the process obtaining energy is uh, catabolism and taking ammonia etc and building amino acids is anabolism okay so anabolism is going to require a chemical energy and the chemical energy is usually uh, in the form of these molecules i am not going to get into the details because we are going to look at each one of them their structure and function later when we get into uh, metabolism uh, details 
so these are the molecules these are highly reduced and uh, their oxidation gives to the energy required to drive the anabolic reactions and so here you have the precursor molecules getting converted into macro molecules so that's anabolism and then you can see from the products why this is important right you need to make proteins polysaccharides lipids and nucleic acids etc for normal cellular function from the precursors so these usually come from the food <coughs> now when these are being broken down by for example the glucose breakdown in mitochondria uh, then these molecules are reduced and that is how the chemical energy from this are transferred and temporarily stored here and then you have energy depleted molecules into the atmosphere okay so so this the these are the uh, you know steps are the two different major groups one set called anabolism another set called the catabolism so the main point is uh, in this bullet here so while this appears like a cycle it is not perfect like a certain quantum of energy that is required for this anabolism a specific anabolic reaction is not fully realized when that particular macromolecule in the reverse reaction is converted into energy depleted end product so it, essentially you need more than what you produce in the opposite direction and the difference is lost into the environment in the form of heat and increasing the overall entropy okay that is how living system obeys the laws of thermodynamics particularly in this case we are talking about the second law of thermodynamics the entropy keeps increasing so energy flows continuously from the sun and it is not perfectly used in the cycling instead some energy leaves from the biosphere into the universe so essentially this is unidirectional flow of energy so organisms can't retrieve energy lost in the form of heat and entropy so with this i'll stop here and tomorrow we will continue uh, into other aspects of metabolism like the main characteristics of metabolism uh, still overall views and then we will get into some important um, basic chemistry concepts required for understanding metabolism so that's what we'll do it in the next class